Uh, hang on, is this working? Yes, it would appear so. Hello everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Young Wolves Podcast. Today we are talking about why electric cars are so difficult. Hang on, you should be able to see me. I will switch to screen share when I actually have something interesting to show. Right now, I should probably close the door right now. in the Edgerton Center Student Project Lab, which is a makerspace here. The, it's our mascot, it's a sloth, I think. Anyways, um, should be an interesting location, and I have lots of props to use to talk about the electronics. So, the interesting thing that people often don't realize about electric cars is that they are much older than you think, and we'll get to the self-driving part in a moment. I know this about self-driving cars. Uh, electric cars are much older than you think. Um, electric cars go back to, I want to say like the 1920s. Um, there was um, sort of a point in time at which actually people were not certain whether the electric car or the internal combustion engine would end up being the car of the future and um, Edison and Ford apparently made a bet against each other about this and you know within their lifetimes it became clear that Ford had won you know um, gasoline cars took over there were no electric cars or very few electric cars for most of the 20th century but as technology improved that changed. Uh, the key problem of an electric car is not actually the motor. I mean, don't get me wrong, the motors in these things are very impressive and they are by no means just, you know, normal like DC blushes motors. They're weird. But, uh, you know, making powerful motors is something people have understood for quite a while. Uh, what people have not been able to do is to make a battery that stores energy on a level comparable to the amount of energy that you can store in gasoline chemical bonds in uh, gasoline, I think there's like 40 CH bonds in a gasoline molecule or something nuts, uh, store a whole lot of energy. I mean, that's why when you burn it, it burns so quickly. Um, to create a battery that has similar energy density, to create a car that can go for a similar distance is difficult. Now, there are also ways to sidestep this. You could, for example, uh, you know, have inductive charging things in the roads and then have the roads, you know, charge your car or you could have wires overhead. If any of you guys are from the Bay Area and you've been to San Francisco, you might notice that all the muni buses are powered this way uh, with wires overhead and like uh, sticks that like go up and touch the wires. There are ways to get around it. But anyways, batteries are a huge issue. Uh, whether you like them or not, Tesla are the only people right now who have a electric self-driving car that is any in any way like you know usable. So, or at least you know usable for most of the things a gas car would be usable for. So let's first look at what they did with the batteries. It's lithium-ion batteries, same kind of battery that you have in. Um, sorry, it might be lithium polymer, but. Um, they're lithium based, which is interesting because that is the same kind of battery that everyone's pretty much converged on for modern electric cars. There were older ones that used, I think, uh, NIMH, but nickel metal hydride, but lithium based cells get you in, uh, you know, more energy than other kinds. Here's the big problem. They produce heat and if they heat up too much, they catch fire. Uh, and as you can imagine, if you're storing enough energy to run a car for a couple hundred miles, if all that energy is released at once, you get a very, very difficult to put out fire. So it becomes quite an issue. And what Tesla did that was at the time unusual is they liquid cooled the batteries. This makes them last longer because they're not under thermal stress and it also means that you don't get things overheating. Liquid cooling in a similar way to, you know, computer liquid cooling works where you have you know, fluid circulating that absorbs the heat and then goes into some kind of heat exchanger system. The alternative way is to have you know, air cooling, fans blowing on stuff, but that doesn't remove enough heat fast enough. 
So that's the first problem you encounter when making these these cars, is just the batteries don't store enough energy. Also, youngwongs.com slash podcast for questions. I will check if anybody has uh, anything yet. Uh, here we go. Why is being a self-driving car so hard? Nothing yet. Is anybody watching right now? Send me a thing in the question thing. Anyways. Self-driving. Self-driving is one of the hardest engineering problems right now, I would say. You know, that's obviously a ridiculous generalization, but in terms of engineering problems that are visible to the public, I don't know, maybe making hypersonic missiles is harder, but the uh, engineering to make something that is completely reliable at being self-driving is difficult. And you might ask, well, why do you have to make a self-driving car completely reliable? Couldn't you just make it more reliable than humans, or similarly reliable to humans? But this raises an interesting legal concern, which is that if you program a self-driving car and it has an issue because the self-driving software isn't perfect, it's not really the driver's fault if it crashes, right? It's the fault of uh, the programmer who made code that wasn't perfect. So liability might end up with the company. So if you wanted to actually sell self-driving cars, you either need really good insurance or you need uh, to build a car that's you know never going to crash. Tesla's had a number of self-driving crashes. Some of them they claim are driver error. Um, I think in some cases they're kind of lying there. Um, but that's a question for another time. The key problem of building a self-driving car is effectively analyzing the environment. If you have some you know, environment around you, you have a road, you have a curb, you have signs, you have uh, traffic cones, you have people crossing the street, you have dogs, you have other cars, there's a lot of things that you have to analyze and factor into your decision making to actually tell the wheels how to move. And this is not easy because, as it turns out, visual processing is really hard. Visual processing in computers has advanced enormously in the last 10 years. It used to be incredibly difficult to get a computer to recognize any object. Nowadays, you know, many of you have probably experimented with OpenCV uh, or with uh, TensorFlow and used it for image recognition. It's not impossible anymore. However, making something that looks at an image and recognizes everything in it flawlessly is really hard. And if we're being honest, humans even make that mistake too. So this brings us to a problem of computation. And I believe the way Tesla solves this is just brute force. They have um, some FPGAs and also I think some custom chips and some GPUs. It depends on which Tesla model you're looking at, but essentially they have massively parallel uh, processing in the cars, just for the visual component. You might ask whether this is taking the long way around, whether humans have some vastly more efficient way of uh, recognizing things that we're just not aware of. And I would actually argue no, because supposedly something like a third of the brain is actually at least loosely connected to visual stuff. So it's not an unreasonable assumption to say that it just takes a vast amount of processing to decode an image. This brings us to the second thing about these cars, which is where do you get your image? Awesome, someone says they're watching, thank you. Uh, where do you get the image? And I don't mean like where do you look, like if you have a sensor you could buy multiple of them, put them all around the car, get more data but what kind of sensor do you use? And this is where Tesla is actually at odds with most of the rest of the industry. Tesla uses cameras, they do not use a LiDAR. Uh, I don't know if I've discussed this before, but a LiDAR um, is a quote unquote light radar, and it's a thing that uh, in some ways spins a laser beam around really quickly and measures the distance uh, to you know, lots of points in space and so it builds up a 3D point cloud of its surroundings. This is obviously a very useful piece of data because a camera doesn't give you the distance to things, it just gives you a flat image. You have to have multiple cameras and then use stereoscopic vision to work out distance. But LiDAR is complicated. 
the kind of LiDAR sensors that Google used for their self-driving are in the like $100,000 or more range. And obviously if you are mass producing these cars that cost might come down, but they're still very sophisticated sensors. And although they give you data that's much easier for a computer to process because the data has depth information in it, there are those who believe that you will never attain human levels of driving if you do not have human levels or if you do not use the same kind of sensing as humans. Humans use cameras. We have two eyes and your brain um, uses the difference between the two images to decode the distance to things. That's why if you close one eye, you become worse at judging distance. Or if you look through a microscope, if you've ever tried to use tweezers under a microscope, you'll find it's like really hard. Part of that's because it's not binocular, so you don't have binocular vision. This is something humans have because the eyes, our eyes are on the front of your head. If you are a chicken watching this, then the eyes are on the side of your head because you're more concerned with being uh, attacked by you know, predators. And so uh, it's more important to have a wide field of view than to have depth perception. But I digress. Depth perception only works if you have two points of view or if you have some kind of sensor that inherently perceives depth, like a LiDAR. So Google had some success with their LiDAR-based self-driving but it was never good enough to really for prime time. So Tesla decided to do it all with cameras on the assumption that if you do it as humans do, then you must uh, be able to get human-like performance. But is that true? Not yet. I couldn't tell you how the processing inside of Tesla works. I'm sure there are people who could explain it to you, but they have signed very strict NDAs. But what we do know is that they have to be able to measure the distance to things. That is a prerequisite to understanding your environment. If you see a person, you need to know, am I going to hit them in one second or 20 seconds or not hit them at all? Distance. You do using binocular vision. You have multiple cameras and you look at the parallax difference between them. If you put your uh, like your finger in, in front of you like like this and then you, op you like switch which eye is open, then you'll see your finger moves positions in your vision. That's because your eyes are not in the same place. So there's a difference between the perspectives that they get and if you do the math on how much your finger was moving, you'd be able to tell how far away the finger is. Uh, doing this on an entire image to obtain a depth map is a little bit more complicated, but if you look in the OpenCD library there are things that will do it for you. So now you have a point cloud. If you got it from a LiDAR, then you have distance because LiDAR tells you distance. If you got it from a camera, you have to pre-process it to use the binocular vision to get you distance. Then you need to turn this point cloud into some kind of data structure that actually understands what things are. And this is, as it turns out, really hard. Tesla actually had a crash where they saw a, uh, like a white truck against a bright sky and the car didn't you know, realize there was a difference and it thought the truck was part of the sky. So there was a crash. Allegedly, the driver was not paying attention at the time, but I mean, who knows? They always say that. Anyways, what's critical to understand there is that um, it's all about segmenting the image into what's actually in the image. You need to take your image that has a truck in it and understand, oh, you know, that's a truck, that's the sky, the truck is this far away moving in this direction. This is an incredibly difficult problem. You can look at image segmentation as an AI problem, which is how Tesla does it. It's all, you know, AI. This kind of processing is too complex to do with really any other, uh, you know, hand-coded algorithms. But, I mean, that's just the tip of the iceberg of problems. Then you have to have all this control stuff to, you know, keep the car in line. You also have to have stuff to handle, you know, weird cases like if there's somebody crossing the road or there's traffic cones or, you know, there's slippery roads. There's all of these conditions that are unusual. And so you end up with um, this intractable problem 
of trying to create a system that perfectly recognizes and perfectly reacts to something that's really, really complicated. And this is where we get out of general, like, you know, established stuff into my personal opinion. My personal opinion is that this problem will never be fully solved. The way this problem will be solved is that over time, governments starting at the city level are going to have to make uh, the roads more self-driving car friendly. If you, you know, had magnetic strips in the road that the cars, you know, could detect and follow, it suddenly becomes a much easier proposition. If all the cars um, have devices in them with short-range radios that can talk to each other so they can coordinate and avoid crashing, then, you know, crashes like this thing where you don't see a truck coming wouldn't happen because there would be direct computer-to-computer -computer communication. The issue, the issue here is that the self-driving car that is designed to work on roads that are, you know, for humans is a transitional technology, and transitional technologies are always weird. I don't know who's watching who's old enough to remember, um, um, like DVDs and CDs, but you know, that's, I feel, kind of a transitional technology. You know, there was a time when uh, media was like, you know, vinyl and then uh, tape, and then now we have digital storage media that can store vast amounts of data on, you know, single drives, and we don't really buy music on physical medium media anyways. But there was this weird transitional time where it was digital media. CDs and DVDs are digital, but it was still a physical disc that you put into things. And there were these weird drives that you had to have that could burn uh, CDs and DVDs. It, they were just a weird technology. And if you really wanted to get into you know transitional technologies, look at um, you can't see them, but here we go. Compact fluorescent lights, the CFL. It's not actually a great lighting technology, but it was much more energy efficient than incandescent lights. And so they became very common as the transitional technology in between incandescents and LEDs. Nowadays, LEDs are cheap enough that if you're putting in new lighting, it makes sense to get LEDs. But there was this period of time where this weird in-between technology of the CFL was the best option. And People never fully solved the problems of CFLs, in my opinion. They still don't produce a great light, and I know that there are people who say that, you know, you can get warm color CFLs that don't produce as much UV light, but the vast majority of CFL lighting is kind of harsh, and people don't like it. Um, not nearly as much as they liked incandescent lighting, and not nearly as much as a lot of people like LED lighting now. So there was this time of a transitional technology that was the best thing available at the time, but never really developed into a satisfactory thing. And I think that that's what a self these self-driving cars are. You're never going to get them perfect because the environment is just too complex for it to deal with. And you might get them really good, but by the time you get them really good, you know, all the cars are going to be self-driving, and if they're all self-driving, there's no point in having them all using cameras to work out where the other cars and looking around and all that stuff. You should only be doing that as a backup mechanism. The cars just need to talk to each other directly, or talk to the roadway directly. I think China said they were building a city that uh, had this, but it's going to take some time, don't get me wrong. But that's my take. It's a transitional technology, and there's never going to be a perfect solution. The perfect solution is going to come as the environment is adapted to be friendlier to self-driving cars. That's all I have to say. Let's see if there are any more questions. Yeah, CDs and DVDs are kind of old now. That's what I'm saying. It's a transitional technology. Everybody wa watches Netflix now. But there was a time when if, the, if you wanted to listen to music, you know, you would either use a vinyl record or a tape or a CD. And the CDs, out of what was available at the time, were the best technology. Were they a good technology? No. But they were the best available at the time, and so we used them for a while. And they were kind of finicky, and they got scratched easily, and you had to burn them with a laser, and it was all this weird stuff, and you had to buy new ones all the time. You couldn't rewrite them unless you got the rewritable kind that was expensive and weird. But 
transitional technology. It takes time to get to the best thing. And I mean, you know, the way we do music now might not even be the best thing, but it's once again the best thing we have at the time. I like to consider something a transitional technology if it exists for only a short gap of time in between two technologies that last for a very long time. Flash media, which is what we use now for data storage, you know, like solid state drives, thumb drives, anything that has flash in it, is going to last quite a long time, I think, unless someone comes up with some new genius way of storing data. Likewise, vinyl lasted a really long time, like, like 100 years or something. But in between, there was this short period of time where you had a technology that was not great, but was the best thing at the time. Anyways, that's all I have. Um, I don't know if you want to see anything else here. There's a laser harp over there. It's kind of cool if you pluck the, the laser beams like, like strings. It, it makes sounds like a harp. I found this uh, not dead, but somewhat disassembled electric scooter that doesn't appear to be owned by anybody. I'm trying to see if I can get it working so I have a way to get around campus. A lot of random interesting electronics left around in this maker's space. Anyways, um, kind of interesting because the motor in this is a brushless motor, uh, similar to the kinds used in many electric cars. Uh, brushless means that uh, the motor is inside out. The permanent magnets are on the outside and they rotate and then the coils are on the inside and they stay stationary. So the way that the motor is operated is by like switching the coils in a certain order that basically pushes the magnets on the outside around. The advantage there is you don't have to have uh, commutation, commutator brushes, which um, if you look at uh, brushed DC motors, you realize that the way that they're switching the direction of the current to keep it you know, spinning instead of switching direction as it spins around is that they've got brushes that touch the spinning part of the motor. Honestly, is probably a topic for another episode, like how different kinds of motors work. But um, brush motors are not great because they have like arcing inside because the brushes are a physical contact. So although brushless motors are much more complex to control, they're kind of better. Anyways, that's all I have. Thanks for watching. See ya.